Welcome to the Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Filmmaker Podcast, hosted by Charles Aline and Dr. Christopher C. Odom. On this episode, we speak with Portuguese filmmaker, director, and artist Patricia Vidal Delgado about how she got her feature film, La Lainda Negra, into the Sundance Film Festival and how she got it distributed through HBO Max. This episode is sponsored by the Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival, which is dedicated to ensuring that Caribbean and Latino filmmakers have a voice that's heard and a wide audience to showcase their work. The Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival is the only combined Caribbean and Latino film festival that is Oscar qualifying for short films. Each year, Our Vision will screen the winners of the short film categories live in theaters on both coasts for one week as part of the requirements for Oscar consideration. Click the link in our profile now to submit your film to the next Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival to share your work, reach your audience, and turn your dreams into reality. I want to welcome you guys to another podcast. We have a couple on our belt. So far, it's been really good. And today we have a really great and incredible uh, filmmaker. I'm going to let her introduce herself. And she's going to tell us a little bit about yourself. Go ahead, Patricia. Tell us a little. Introduce yourself. So I'm Patricia Vidal Delgado. Um, I'm from Portugal originally. Uh, I came to L.A. in the summer of 2015 to start my master's program at UCLA in production slash directing. And uh, and that program, you're allowed to make uh, a feature film for your thesis. Uh, and that is how I became connected to uh, Charles through the incredible Juan Reynoso, who, apart from being a fantastic teacher at Compton High uh, at the time, uh, is also a SAG actor and an incredibly talented filmmaker himself. Oh, nice, nice, nice. So you want to tell us, let's start, How? what led you to become a filmmaker? What was the initial spark and what made you want to become a filmmaker? I think essentially it's a desire to tell stories, especially from a female perspective, which is one that historically has been somewhat overlooked in the, in the history of cinema. And I actually started out as a camera assistant Mm, So, I mean, I went to art school in London uh, and then when I graduated because, you know, I had been kind of making my own experimental films with my little video camera and I I knew my way around that kind of equipment. Uh, That's how I started to, to get into camera assisting. And I really saw that it was true that there weren't really that many female writer directors. It was a it was a perspective that was you know, somewhat marginal or marginalized. And I kind of wanted to to be the difference that I wanted to see, you know? So you wanted to fill a gap, some, a need that wasn't there. That I felt it, it was, was lacking, absolutely. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So let's talk about when you get to America, you get to UCLA, what was that whole experience like? And what was the... Did you do a uh, like a short film before you did your feature film? And what was that experience like? So I had already made a couple of short films in Lisbon oh, before gosh. I applied to, to the master's program um, at UCLA. So really I used those films to apply to, to the master's program. But what was interesting is that when I, when I started, I thought, oh, everyone's gonna be at the same, at the same level. Everyone's gonna have um, made a couple of films. But it was interesting that even at that master's level, there were quite a few students who hadn't even made anything wow. at all. Wow. Um, and so the, the uh, level of experience like differed greatly. Uh, amongst us. And we weren't that big a pool of uh, writer directors. We were maybe like 30 Hmm. in my year. And that included cinematographers as well. We had about um, five or six cinematographers uh, that were in the same program as us. And really that first year at UCLA is boot camp. 
You know, we were we were at school almost like 12 hours a day, uh, making films, writing films, crewing on each other's films. And that would extend into the weekend. So we were lucky if we got like one day off just to like sleep and catch up with homework because it was very uh, intensive. And in that way, I think the program is very much designed for people that if you're coming in and you've never made your own films, um, they they want you to catch up in that first year because we have to make at least two short films in our first year. One of them is very, very short. It's like, a, a, they call it the two minute film. And then the other one is the, is the six minute film. But we do have to make two in our first years, like straight away out the gate. Okay, so let me ask you a question. That six minute film, was that the one you guys shipped? Um, was that the one that introduced you to um, Mr. Reynoso at Compton? Yes, he, I, I was introduced to Mr. Reynoso really through Dallas King, who was the head of the Bruin network, because he had done a lot of outreach with um, uh, high schools in uh, South Central, because he was very interested in teaching. And so he knew about all sorts of like film workshops that were going on. And he was the one who said, oh, Mr. Reynoso is, is running like one of the best programs out of Compton High. And so, you know, if you're interested in like, you know, finding young actors, like young talent, he might be able to point you in the right direction. Uh, and so when I met Mr. Reynoso, and he, I mean, he was fantastic. He was so welcoming. Um, his students were so enthusiastic, like such like smart, uh, cool kids. Uh, and so some of his students were already in that short film, which is called uh, The Hood, that um, also Mr. Reynoso plays a cop in. So yeah, he the, has a little. What was the hood about? I mean, what, what was the what was this what was the story about? So it's about um, a struggling actor who is uh, in callbacks for a role as a as a rapper, but he's like not even from L.A. And so he's like, you know, this director really, um, really wants to see authenticity and really wants to see that I've put in some some research and that I've gone out and I've actually like met like real actual Compton rappers. Uh, and so he comes to to meet uh, Omar, who is an actual real Compton born and bred rapper to kind of, you know, ask him, like, how do you go about like writing your songs? Like what inspires you? What are you into? Um, but he gets he gets the full experience, which is also unfortunately, you know, one of the, the great things about Compton is like all the culture, all the art. But then also one of the very bad things is all the racial profiling and that that sort of stuff, which is also um, something that Omar um, talked to me about. So me as a female, uh, uh, hold on a second, Charles, as a female director, uh, what sort of vision did you try and voice did you try to bring to your short, The Hood? Well, I think it was, it was seeing that, you know, at least something that interests me is very much like where um, art meets life like that in oh, oh sorry just gonna reject a call here since i am doing this on my phone very sorry it's the beauty of hello the yes <laughs> um so like the intersection between art and real life and maybe that's not specifically you know a a woman's perspective but it is it is at least a, pers a perspective that I feel is particular to me and my sensibility because you know I went I went to art school for my undergraduate and something that has always you know inspired me is finding you know the truth like that is art for me is is about seeking the truth representing the truth and whether that's through a work of fiction or nonfiction, to me, what that's interesting is the the intersection. Like, where does art rub up against real life, and what does that friction produce? I, I saw on your website that some of your earlier work, as you mentioned, you went to the School of the Art, was like uh, experimental installations. How would you compare and contrast the uh, the experimental filmmaking and the installation work to traditional narrative filmmaking? I think the good thing about um, art school is that 
there isn't like a right or wrong. You're very much encouraged to, you know, pursue your creative journey, um, make mistakes. You know, is there really anything as a, that you could call a mistake if you learned from it? I, and I think there's also an emphasis on learning how to do everything yourself and I do think that that's advantage especially going into film school that you end up knowing a little bit about everything about you know production about cameras about sound about post-production because especially in art school like if you were making your own film you were doing that from start to finish as a general rule uh, and I just think that that gives you a technical uh, know-how that maybe I would not have had if I had not been making my own films already um, at, at art school. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Since you've been in America, do you feel like you're following your vision? Like you're, do you find like, are there <laughs> like obstacles? People say, no, you can't do it that way. No, I think you need to approach it that way because if you want to be like say more commercial, you know, you have to maybe tone it down or maybe go in a different direction. Have you find any sort of barriers like that way? Um, I mean, I think that in many ways I've been allowed to forge my own creative path. I mean, I guess I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a manager and I mean, he's never really pressured me to take any work that I don't want you know often he will like send me a, a script because really I'm more in the the narrative space and I'm allowed you know I, I'm allowed to read it and kind of express my own um opinions and and really you know I mean I think it's a compromise that I think every every creative has to make that you can work on your own projects you can work on your own scripts but you have to find some other way to like keep the lights on and that's where i've been doing a lot of dubbing work for for netflix that's really where i've been how i've been supporting myself while i'm still writing my my own scripts have you been directing dub work or exactly yes for oh, netflix, okay. primarily um interesting <laughs> so what has that experience been like for you just to, doing that to keep the, the the lights on so to speak i mean it's i mean it's, i love working with actors i really do i genuinely do and i mean getting to you know cast your own projects and work with the um the actors that you want to work with is is a blessing it's it's lovely to have you know, actors that you adore and uh, think are super talented, um, to have them in the booth is is a wonderful thing. I mean, the 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 converse of that is when you get pressure from the studio to cast direct um, to cast actors that maybe you don't think are the the best actors or even the really right for the role. That's maybe been the most challenging to be honest but even that is important to to learn how to navigate that because you know if you if you end up directing an episode of tv you're almost certainly going to have to work with difficult actors and you have to learn how to do that how to keep it professional and how to keep the job how to get the job done so um have you all right let, let me let me put it this way have you run up to any situations where you feel okay I can't work with this person now this act is being difficult and you know how 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 do I go about not hurting somebody's feelings but yet getting the job done I mean what's the, how do you maneuver that 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 um that feel so to speak well I think that you always have to try and find the the common goal and maybe remind the the actor who might be being a bit difficult of the common goal which is essentially we both want to record this and get it done so we can finish at the end of the day and everyone can go home <laughs> like we both <laughs> want that right that's yeah. our mutual goal. So let's work together to achieve this mutual goal. I think that when you break it down to just that basic need, 
most actors as difficult as they're going to be like, okay, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Like, I just, I just want to, you know, finish dubbing this film so I can, you know, uh, hang up my hat and go home. Yeah. Yeah. So we can get out of here. <laughs> What I and in which case, we're on the same page. There's no <laughs> argument there, you know? What I find, right, as a director, like when I first um, ventured into being a director and working with actors, you know, you have to create some sort of relationship with them where they trust your vision, right? Because a lot of actors feel, oh, what does this guy know? I'm just going to do it my way. Even if you give them directions, they're like, in the back of the hell, I'm, I'm, in the back of their head, they're going to say, well, you know, I'm going to still do it my way, right? So I find that uh, communication and uh, uh, talking with them and them getting to know me and I getting to know them so I can create a trust, a bond there where they can actually, you know, trust my vision and realize I know what I'm doing, right? I'm not going to jeopardize you, you know, because most actors, their bread and butter is their performance, right? So mm -hmm. I, I always let them know I'm not going to jeopardize and put you in a situation where you're not going to shine, right? So I try to uh, convey that to most of my actors that I work with. And I find, not always, but majority of the time, I tend to get the, the performance that I want once I have that, 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 um, that trust, right? I tend to get the performance that I want. And I think trust is the big, is a, a, is a main important thing when it comes to acting. When you come into mm -hmm. directing, directing actors, they need to trust you. They need to know that you know what you're doing and you can explain to them, okay, this is what I want from you. This is what the mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. think, right? I think that I, I tend to think that that makes a huge difference. So P Patricia, since we're talking about directing actors, what's your approach when you're working with an actor who isn't necessarily trying to be difficult? but already passionately has their own vision for the part that might be very different from the vision that you had for that part in performance? Well, I think it's always important to listen to them because they might have an insight that you, you might never have considered. And especially if it's a script that you have written, you can sometimes get so close to it that you're, you're, you're not even objective about what you've written anymore. You can't really, it's, it's like a, a kid, you know, it's like your child, it's your baby. And there are, there are certain angles and perspectives that you might not really see anymore. So I think it's always good to, to listen because they might tell you something that it's like, oh my God, I never really thought about that, but that's actually really, really good. And, and I think especially very talented actors, like they will bring a wealth to your project. They will bring riches to your film, but you have to let them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, is, this has been a really amazing conversation to have, right? I just love talking about directing that actually, because I'm, at, at heart, I love directing, you know, that's one of my favorite mm -hmm. things that I want to do. But let me just um, ask you a question, getting back to Compton. So now when you arrive at Compton and you're doing your short, what was the, you know, getting to Compton and seeing Compton, what was that experience like for you, the, 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 like the culture of it? I think that, you know, it's it's uh, there's so much. Obviously, there's so much, uh, you know, negative press. And I think you you speak to, you know, anyone in L.A. and they'll be like, oh, my God, don't go there. Are you like crazy? Are you nuts? That's insane. But what I think often gets uh, overlooked about Compton is just the the kindness and the warmth of people. At least that has been my experience. You know, the. And I'm sure that, you know, Mr. Reynoso made a big difference because he was the one who was introducing me to people like uh, Omar Miller, who then introduced me to the other members of Salam Nation, which is his rap group, um, Dorian, who, who is also part of the group, um, introducing me to people like Sammy Flores, who was part of the, the crew, um, who then introduced me to Justin Avila, who I work with all the time now on, on dubbing, uh, who's a fantastic actor and is now SAG. 
um, introducing, and you know, Mr. Reynolds introduced, uh, introducing to Ilan, but to Kaylee, like to Aaron, like all these kids that were just, you know, the sweetest, kindest people that I've met in a very, very long time. And I think that if, you know, if I had just listened to what every, you know, every local, uh, and he'll, you know, was telling me of like, oh my God, don't go there. You're insane. I would have completely missed out on all these absolutely incredible people that I love. Like I honest to God, I, I love them. And I wouldn't want to imagine my life without them. Este episodio está patrocinado por el Festival de Cine Latino y Caribeño Art Vision, que se dedica a garantizar que los cineastas latinos y caribeños tengan una voz que se escuche y una amplia audiencia para mostrar su trabajo. El Festival de Cine Latino y Caribeño Art Vision es el único festival de cine latino y caribeño combinado que califica para los Oscar a los cortometrajes. Cada año, Art Vision proyectará a los ganadores de las categorías de cortometrajes en vivo en los cines en ambas costas durante una semana como parte de los requisitos para la consideración del Oscar. Haga clic en el enlace en nuestro perfil ahora para enviar su película al próximo festival de cine latino y caribeño Art Vision para compartir su trabajo, llegar a su audiencia y convertir sus sueños en realidad. I mean, that, that's From incredible. Go ahead, Chris. From from Portugal to London to Los Angeles to Compton, <laughs> how has uh, culture influenced you as an artist? I mean, I think that uh, so at least in Portugal, I'm from Lisbon, which is like a big. It's our big dirty city. It's obviously you know it's not as big as London. It's not as big as LA, but we still have very much you know that that urban environment and that cultural melting pot. You know, I'm sure you know uh, uh, Portugal, we have a lot of like um, former colonies. And so we have people from Angola, we have people from Mozambique, we have people from um, Cabo Verde, we have people from Brazil. And it just makes for such a unique uh, cultural melting pot that is something that I grew up surrounded by and was also really inspired by. And it's something that I have seen kind of replicated in these in these major capitals is that a uh, melting pot of cultures which I just I love I absolutely love and uh, you know especially in Compton you know you have the Latino community so you've got people from El Salvador you have people from Mexico obviously um, from Guatemala um, and that also makes for a very unique cultural environment and that was something that in my feature I definitely wanted to portray because I think you know it East LA, you know, there are a lot of films I have been shot in East LA. And so that's a Latino community that um, has has been has been beautifully represented in in film, but very few people know about the Latino community in Compton. And so I wanted to showcase that as well. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about your I think it's your thesis project now that you got which is your feature length film that you did how did that came about what what's the idea behind it and give us the name let's start off with the name first and then we talk about how you came about writing it and putting it together so the the title is La Leyenda Negra and I started writing it at the end of 2017 uh, in in a screenwriting class at UCLA, and while I was writing the film, I was also, you know, talking to Mr. Reynoso and saying, you know, the I loved shooting that that short film here. I'm thinking about making a feature, and you know, maybe I could speak to some of your students who are interested in in acting and maybe try and kind of write a script that they could star in. Um, and it was through conversations with some of his students. Um, some of them were undocumented. And that was something that, you know, listening mm. to those stories really inspired me. Because especially like under the Trump administra administration, those, those kids were definitely under attack. Like all those kids who had DACA or TPS had just very, um, were very vulnerable uh, under the politics of 
of Trump. And that's definitely something I was like, we, you know, that this is what I want to write about. This is what I want to focus on. Yeah. Great, great, great. And so you get to that point, you, you did the casting. How did that go? I mean, how did you get everybody to agree and start casting? And who did you decide which, which role? How did you put that whole part of it together? Well, what I did, what I would do um, is, you know, there were the kids that Mr. Reynolds who were like, oh, you know, for example, like um, Kaylee, I think she would be great. So you should definitely speak to Kaylee. And what I did wasn't so much um, an audition. It was maybe more of an interview. I just kind of like sat her down with a camera and just like asked her questions about, you know, her life, her upbringing, you know, her her dreams, her aspirations. And then from, from there, it's like, I kind of started to craft a character that was not exactly like her, but had elements of her. And then I, our first group audition, which was with Kaylee, um, was with Sammy and was with Irlanda. That's where I was, that I started to see like the chemistry of, of the group uh, and started to see, you know, what, that it could work. And I think it also helped that they knew each other, like Kaylee and Sammy already knew each other. They, they went to Compton High together. Um, Irlanda was in the year below them. So maybe it wasn't exactly part of their friend group, but they knew, they knew of her. And I think that organic familiarity that they already had, like it, it created magic on, on screen for me. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I really love that you were flexible with your vision and as an artist to be able to capitalize on magic that you might not have been able to think of before you got there and met the cast. Cool. So, um, mm -hmm. Patricia, you finished the film now. It's in the can. You like I from be, from the guy behind the scenes. I know a little bit about the film, so. You get, you finish it, you know, you, you go to Sundance, right? How do we get from Compton to Sundance? And there's, there's <laughs> something missing in there. There's, there's something missing in there. So I don't know if you want to share that part. So we finished editing the film in the summer of... 2019, I want to say, because we, we finished shooting in, in the summer of 2018. So it was basically a year in post-production. Um, and I actually sent the, um, uh, the link to a friend of mine who is a, a Brazilian sales agent, uh, because, wow. you know, I, a lot of I have a a group of like indie filmmakers and they were all like, look, you know, um, sales agents know film festivals and distributors better than anyone like it's it's their job you know they know they know who's coming up um they know you know what they're looking for so if you have a connection to a sales agent send him the film and just ask him his his honest opinion and that's what i did um and because he really i mean he really really specializes in um portuguese language or spanish language films and Lali and the Negra, it has a lot of Spanish in it, but it's still a, a you know, majority English spoken film. Um, he was he was the one who said to me, um, I think that you should send this to Sundance. I think that this is the kind of stuff that they that they look for. It's the kind of stuff that they program. I really think that you you should send it. Um, and I don't know if maybe maybe he put in a good word. I didn't. I mean, I didn't ask him to. I really just asked him for his like honest opinion. Um, but I sent it and then I got a phone call in November from a programmer saying, Oh, you we we picked your film. Oh nice. Did you um, quick yeah. question? Did you, did you phone your mom in uh, Portugal or your dad and just say, Hey, I'm uh, you know, your family, I, I made it into um, Sundance. I'm so happy. Did what was that when you share your you know, you accept, you know, getting into Sundance with your immediate family. Well, the thing is, is that they, they swear you to secrecy. Oh. You're not allowed oh. to tell anyone until January, which is, I, I think it is January that they, oh. I think they published their- Not even your family? <laughs> well, the thing is, is that my, my mother would probably have told everyone. Everyone, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So 
I told my sister because my sister's more um, great. <laughs> How yeah. early did Sundance notify you that you were selected? I think it was November, if my memory serves me. Oh, okay, yeah, that that that's pretty far out. <laughs> yeah, and then and then maybe yeah, I do I do think, and that's the thing. It's like they they want to keep it under wraps. So you have to be selective in terms of who you do tell. And obviously I told my editor because I knew that we were going to have to like explore a bunch of stuff. Um, but I, I, yeah, I tried to like keep it to myself as much as I could because I was so scared that if I tell too many people, they'll change their minds <laughs> and pull, pull the film. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now, once you accept it and it's out there, it's January and you can tell everyone, what was that like now? No, the, the 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 cat is out of the bag, so to speak. At this point, the cat is out of the bag. You can tell everyone that you and Sundance. What was the experience like now at that point? Well, it was it was really fantastic because um Monica who who plays the the lead role was able to come um Mr. Reynoso very kindly brought um Sammy as well and Irlanda and uh, Kaylee came with her mother and her boyfriend like it was really so great that so many of the cast members were able to like come and represent and be present for the the premiere like that that was really super special and then also seeing Monica who I think had been very shy like really coming out of her shell and like doing interviews and being like super engaging and charismatic and sh you know showing off like all her her intelligence and maturity like it was I feel that it really gave the kids like a confidence boost you know because I don't I don't think any of them really thought that they were any good I don't think any of them really thought that they were like good or decent actors. And I was the one who was always like, no, but you are <laughs> like, believe me, you are. Sometimes thinks you are too. Look, you know, I think that made so, a, a big difference. Once you got into Sundance, did you put together a formal strategy of what you were going to do each day at Sundance? Did you get a publicist? Did you get a producer's rep? What, what was your whole strategy for the festival? I mean, Sundance has definitely put a, a, I mean, I don't want to say that they put a lot of pressure on us, but at least from, from day one, they were like, you, you have to have a publicist. Like, you need to get one, go get one. And we, we got Rob Fleming from Prodigy, um, a PR, and he was fantastic. Um, he, he's a gay man himself. And I think he was really, um, he was very, uh, he was connected to to the film, which is an LGBTQ love story, um, and it, and uh, he did a fantastic job. And then I think it's essentially what a publicist does is they are the ones who determine your schedule for you because every single day they'll they'll line up um, interviews uh, wow. with all the different um, uh, news outlets or websites. Uh, he did an excellent job. And so for me and Monica, like our, our day was essentially determined by Rob, Rob Fleming. And he did he did a brilliant job. I, I couldn't recommend him um, more, more highly. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that experience sounded like it was a fantastic experience. Do you have one particular experience at Sundance that you stood out for you more than others? Uh, I think, I think it's definitely got to be the premiere, like having the film, like for the first time, you know, being born really, cause that's what it feels like. The film is now born and it's like out in the world, you know, and hearing people, you know, laugh at the jokes, um, applaud at the at the end or like come up to you at the end and say like you know I was really moved by that story or I didn't even know that that this was an issue in America that there are these these kids that were like brought here when they were like two years old and now they're being kicked out and sent back to countries where they have no one and they barely speak the language like you know, that's that's such an injustice. Like just having people come up to you and tell you that it's like, that's exactly what we made the film for. 
it served its purpose. That's great. Um, so now Sundance is over. How did how does Sundance like um, what's the word like jump off? Give you that push? Did it give you a push where everybody's like? open-handed now like you figure like have you feel like you arrived now you can take hollywood by storm i, I don't know <laughs> what, what's the mindset when you leave um sundance well i mean i think that we we probably you you feel that like buzz and you feel that like oh things are gonna happen but then you have to remember that that was 2020 so then the world <laughs> went into oh, a yeah. two-year pandemic yeah and so, you know, we could have probably, we probably could have screened at a lot more festivals than we ended up screening at because, you know, 2020, a lot of festivals just didn't have an edition that year. Mm. Uh, and so I think a lot of the momentum that we could have had was unfortunately lost due to circumstances somewhat beyond our control. So your film eventually finds its way to distribution on HBO. I guess now they call it Max or Max. Uh, how did you get from Sundance to HBO? So even before Sundance publishes its official selection, um, we already had sales agents contacting our our producers um, saying, oh, you know, do do you do you guys have a distributor yet? You know, and if you don't, maybe we could talk about securing distribution for you. So we had several uh, sales agents contact us and, you know, me and my producers like met with them, spoke with them. And in the end, we, we picked the one who I felt uh, understood the film the best and understood the audience for the film. Uh, and he was the one who had the the contact at HBO, um, who he knew was looking for um, films that were essentially uh, geared towards a Latino audience. And the film did then stream on cable on, uh, for HBO Latino, which is an actual channel that, that they have. Sometimes filmmakers are apprehensive to sign a contract with a sales agent because of what happens on the business side. Uh, how did you approach whether or not you, you know you were comfortable working with a sales agent? And did you seek out sales agents or you only work with the sales agents who sought you out after the Sundance premiere? Um, I, we only worked cause I mean, we, we had so many sales, sales agents contact us that really we were like, we're just, we're just going to go with the ones that are pursuing us. Cause I feel sometimes if you're the one pursuing them, it's like, you're already approaching them at a disadvantage. It's almost like, well, you want something from me. I don't want anything from you, which is not great. You have the sales agent has to be hungry. The sales agent has to be like, you know, I want this film. I want this film more than all the other people who are speaking to you. Um, and we definitely felt that with the with the sales agent that we ended up uh, going with. And the fact that my sister is a lawyer meant that, you know, she was like, don't sign anything that you haven't had an attorney look at. Like that's for her. It's like, don't, you know, get a trusted attorney to look over the contract. And if you're happy uh, and if, if the attorney says, like, this is all kosher or if it's not kosher, we need to change this, 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 this and that. Um, but don't sign anything until you get a trusted attorney to look at it. And um, that's essentially that's what that's what I did. Oh, I, I actually forgot the traditional questions for a feature. What was your budget and uh, what did you shoot on? <laughs> um, so our budget was um, 50K. And we shot on um, my DP uh, at the time he had a red scarlet. Oh, nice. Which was his, like that nice. was his um, actual camera. And then I think we also used one of the school's cameras, which was a Canon. I want to say a C500, but I'm not 100% sure. It was probably a C500. Yeah. All right, uh, Patricia. So what you got, you got the film on the year about it did the premiere, you got an HBO Max, you did the whole thing. Um, do you have anything that you're working on like now? And how do you, what, what's what's next with Patricia? 
So um, the great thing is like, I do feel that Sundance, you know, once you've had a premiere there, they do recognize that it's, it's uh, very hard to get that second feature going after you've had your first. So I was lucky enough to get into a lab, which is called um, the Film 2 Fellowship, where essentially they help you uh, write a script, write the script for your, for your second feature, and they pair you with creative advisors. Um, and I was lucky enough to have Anish Chiganti, uh, who's, who's fantastic. He did, um, uh, I think, Searching and Run. Uh, and my next feature, it's it's a horror, and I think that's why they paired me with him because he's done a lot in the in the thriller, uh, in the thriller space. So he understands like tension um, and all of that. Uh, and so that script um, that I'm working on now, uh, my executive producer on La Leyenda Negra is going to be the producer on that one. And so what we're really trying to do now is attach talent because at least that's kind of um, the way that we have seen it works is that often you won't be able to get a studio to even read your script until they know what talent is attached. And since, it, and since it's a film where the lead has to be uh, a Portuguese woman, there are only really a couple of Portuguese actresses that Hollywood even recognizes. <laughs> so that really kind of narrows the pool but if we do manage to get them on board, then I think my producer strategy is then to approach uh, studios or production companies and that way secure financing to start uh, pre-production. So on the surface, horror feels like it, it's very different from La Leyenda Negra. But uh, as an artist, what themes are you really drawn towards uh, exploring that doesn't matter what genre it is, that you can still explore those themes in your work? Well, I think it's still very much espousing the, the female perspective and the themes it's, it's talking about are uh, maternity, um, womanhood, uh, familial trauma. So it is still, it's, it's, um, a horror lens, but it's still talking very much about the female experience. Uh, and I think that's that's my way in uh, to that film. Um, and it's essentially about uh, the, the lead character's relationship with her mother, which is very troubled. Uh, and then how that kind of feeds into a uh, legacy and, and um, generational trauma between mother and daughter. Wow, that 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 sounds like I mean <laughs> and, um, <laughs> heavy. <laughs> very heavy, yeah. very heavy for like a, um for that particular type of genre. Uh, is it set in the US or is it set in uh, Portugal? So we would have um, a couple of scenes shot in LA, then I would say 60% uh, shot in, in Portugal, and then actually uh, another 40% shot in Costa Rica because the lead character is half Portuguese, half Costa, half Costa Rican. Oh, that, that sounds exciting. <laughs> uh, very visual. All right. So I want to thank you, Patricia, for coming on this podcast. I mean, it's been an exciting, really fun. I learned a lot. I, 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 you had me as a student, <laughs> you know, because I learned, you know, it was really incredible. It was really incredible uh, podcast. And I wish the best for you as you continue your your journey, you know, and when you get your Oscars, don't forget to give me a shout out. <laughs> Well, I mean, no, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, giving me the, the opportunity. And thank you so much for, for doing this, for putting in like the time and the effort and for shining a light on, uh, on filmmakers who, you know, who kind of believe in the power of stories as much as you do as well. Appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay, Patricia, thank you for coming on and have a beautiful day. Beautiful you rest too. of your day. All right, thank, thank you, you so Patricia. Much. Thank you so much, Chris. Bye-bye. This episode is sponsored by the R Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival, which is dedicated to ensuring that Caribbean and Latino filmmakers have a voice that's heard and a wide audience to showcase their work.
The R Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival is the only combined Caribbean and Latino film festival that is Oscar qualifying for short films. Each year, Our Vision will screen the winners of the short film categories live in theaters on both coasts for one week as part of the requirements for Oscar consideration. Click the link in our profile now to submit your film to the next Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival to share your work, reach your audience, and turn your dreams into reality.